Income tax 2023-2024 self-employment tax or SE tax tax software example. Get ready some coffee and relax because as taxpayers, you really don't have much more to lose. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our Accounting Rocks product line. If you're not crunching cords using Excel, you're doing it wrong. A must-have product. Because the fact, as everyone knows, of accounting being one of the highest forms of artistic expression means accountants have a requirement, the obligation, a duty, to share the tools necessary to properly channel the creative muse. And the muse, she rarely speaks more clearly than through the beautiful symmetry of spreadsheets. So get the shirt, because the creative muse, she could use a new pair of shoes. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Here we are in our form 1040 example problem using Lacert tax software. You don't need tax software to follow along, but if you have access to it, it's a great tool to run scenarios with. You can also get access to forms, instructions, schedules at the IRS website, irs.gov, irs.gov. Standard starting point, Adam Taxman, just trying to avoid a dang tax man. Living in Beverly Hills, 90210, single filer, no dependents, starting with W-2 income, which we will shortly change to Schedule C or sole proprietor income, 100000 Standard deduction, 13850 gives us the taxable income, 86150 which we can mirror in our income tax formula. 100000 deduction, 13850 the taxable income, 86150 tax calculated by the software, 14266 on page 2 of the Form 1040. 14266. Okay, that's our standard starting process. Let's go back to the first page. Now we want to be thinking about what happens if we change from that W-2 income once again to a Schedule C type situation. In a prior presentation, we saw that there's a lot of different things that are impacted as we do so. Our major focus this time, however, is to focus in on the self-employment uh, tax which will be calculated, which is really important and something that we want to be comparing to what would happen if we were in a W-2 situation. So remember, if I go back on over here, and if we were in a W-2 situation, how do we deal with our taxes? Well, the government, of course, uh, will go after the employer in order to induce them to withhold our money uh, as the employee. So if we made 100000 for example, then we would have federal income taxes that would be withheld based on the W-4, which is a complex calculation. Not only that, however, we would also have withholdings for Social Security and Medicare, which you can see are much more simple calculations. They are basically flat tax calculations, although not that simple because there is a cap on Social Security and there's a bit of a progressive kind of nature to the Medicare, and we also have the complication of this is only the employee portion, which is also kind of matched by the employer. So the employer is also paying 6200 and is paying 1450 The amount represented on the W-2 represents your amount that you paid. You didn't actually physically write a check because the IRS forced the employer to make you pay but it still, in theory, came out of your paycheck, whereas the other 6200 was paid, in theory, by the employer. I say in theory because when you work this all out economically, obviously wage rates change and so on and so forth to compensate for uh, the taxes. So real rate wages are a little bit more different to calculate. But in any case, so you can see that, that the 100000 times the 0.062 is going to be that 6,200. And if I have 100,000 times the 0.0145, 
that's where we get the uh, 1,450. Now, remember that if you go too high, if you go over the cap, say 200,000, then the Social Security got capped because it capped it at income of 160,200. Why does it do that? Because the Social Security more and more in the United States is being thought of as like a, a 401k plan from the federal income tax system which is kind of strange instead of like a safety net type of program. And therefore the tax is quite high. And the more money you put into it under that thought process, the more money that you should uh, get out of it. That's the general idea. Now, again, from my standpoint, I would think the general idea would be just like with federal income taxes, we pay as little as we're legally required to pay, even though the social security, unlike federal income taxes, could result in benefits that come back to us at retirement time due in part to the fact that the Social Security really, in my mind, should be more of a safety net program, number one. Number two, I don't trust the government to manage the money because they aren't managed the money well. And number three, it looks like we're on a path towards the government being insolvent in some part and the hugest piece of the pie for the government spending is Social Security and Medicare, which, is, which means that we're going to hit a wall at some point. So I wouldn't depend on it. I would rather keep the money if I was legally able to do so, pay for my own retirement, and, and, and instead, of, instead of paying into Social Security or pay, for, pay into the government so they can fund the military or something, as opposed to the Social Security, which seems not to be working well. So that's the general theory that I would think. Let's go back to the 100,000. Now, just realize that if the employer paid part of that, when we go to the Schedule C business, we're going to have net income of uh, the 100,000, let's say, and we're going to pay not only the employee portion, but also the employer portion. So that means if you're moving from a W-2 situation to a Schedule C, if you have the same amount of net income, as gross income, you're going to be paying twice as much or about almost twice as much as of Social Security. Now, again, you're going to get deductions and stuff like that. So that might not, you know, it's, so there's pros and cons to go into the Schedule C, but the self-employment tax is a crucial part to keep in mind. So let's see that. Let's say if I delete this and say instead of having the income there, we're going to go and say we have a Schedule C business. And so now we're going to say, let's say that the gross receipts were 120,000 again, and our expenses were 20,000. And so remember that in a W-2 business, if I had 20,000 of expenses, normally I can't deduct them because the idea of being an employee would be that the employer would be paying for those kind of things typically. So by being self-employed, I get these deductions possibly that is good, right? Because now I'm not going to pay social security tax on 120, but rather on the net 120 minus the 20. But the net we're saying still comes out to 100,000. So let's go to the forms. I go to my schedule C, we've got an income statement 120, I get the deductions, which are great. And remember, if the deductions were greater than the income, which could often happen for startup businesses, then I'm not going to pay social security because I'm going to have a loss. Not only that, but I might be able to take the loss against uh, other W-2 income. So we'll talk more about that later. But in this case, I got the same amount of uh, the 100,000 as, uh, as before. So let's see what the self-employment tax, now I've got the uh, self-employment tax, which is the equivalent of the social security, which is basically being calculated at the 14,129. Now remember, uh, prior, the the half of that would have been if I said, if I said we had these uh, 0 0.062 plus 0 0.00145, that gives us the 0 0.0765 total between Social Security and Medicare if we were an employee. If I take that times two, then this is going to be the rate if you think of me as both the employee and employer. And if I multiply that times the 100,000, I get something similar to this, not exact. Notice it's not exact because you have this little bit up top. We might go into that uh, in a little bit more detail, but the general thought process is you're basically paying 
like both the employee and employer portion of your self-employment tax. Now let's go back to the Schedule C and just remember the thought process on why this might be. They usually, when they put in laws for the government, they think of the big companies like a C corporation, and then they have to shore up what they're going to do for like the sole proprietors. So if this was a Schedule C, like a, I'm sorry, a, a C corporation, a separate legal entity that pays taxes on the corporate level, they would have their own kind of income statement. And even the highest people on it, the CEOs and so on, would be receiving wages, right? They'd have wages that they would be uh, receiving. And th that means that even them would be paying Social Security and Medicare through the payroll tax system. And that means that they would have the wages, the withholdings would be included in wages. They would also have their portion of the taxes as a deduction on the C corporation tax return, which would then result in uh, the net income, which would be paid on uh, the corporate level, right? So the net, so the net income would not be assigned to an individual and that would be paid on the individual tax return and thought of as income to them. The net income would be on the corporate level and all the, all the workers, including the CEO and whatnot, would be paying Social Security and Medicare through the wages. And then the net income, who owns the business? The shareholders. So the shareholders have a problem then when they want to draw the money out of the business, because when they draw the money out of the business, it's going to be a dividend. And so with a dividend, you don't have payroll taxes, but possibly more income taxes. So you end up with a double taxation with regards to uh, income taxes. And that's the issue that happens. Uh, and that's why like flow through entities happen like S corporations and LLCs attempting to get liability protection with a separate legal entity and allowing the flow through possibly avoiding the double taxation resulting in trying to pull money out in the form of dividends. Now, the issue there then is like, well, if you're, if, if, if I don't have any employees, then the government's going to say, well, you are, you must be the employee of the government, of the, of the business because you're the one doing all the work, right? So you must be, so we're gonna treat you as the employee. Not only that, but we're gonna treat you as the employer. So any earnings that you have from the government's perspective, they're gonna say, that's like earnings to you. You say, well, do I have to then file a, w, a W-2 to myself? No, that would be quite tedious to do. That would be a pain uh, to do. So it's actually easier to say, okay, there's the net income and then the government's going to treat me as an employee of myself, take that and treat it for self-employment tax, which is, of course, pulling into the Schedule SE and then calculating the tax, both the employee and employer portion. Now, half of the taxes, if we compare this to a Schedule C, you'd say, well, uh, if, if I was an you know, an, if it was an employee situation, I would get to deduct the wages for the for the wages here and and. I would also get the employer portion of the payroll taxes that I would get to deduct. Now, I don't get to deduct the wages because they're wages to myself, right? So they're already income to me in this case because I'm not being taxed at the corporate level. But the the payroll taxes that that I have to pay the, the employer half of the taxes, I should get a deduction for because the C corporation would get a deduction for that. So, okay, so the, they would say, okay, well, we can deduct half of the self-employment tax to be fair. So what, what I would think I would get to deduct it on like tax line, line 23, but I can't deduct it on line 23. Why? Because then that would make the 100,000 go down, resulting in a circle reference. And I had to get to this number in order to calculate the self-employment, right? So that means that half of this self-employment I get to deduct, but not on the Schedule C. It's got to be somewhere else. We're going to put it on the Schedule 1. So that's why when we go to the Form 1040, if I go to page 2, we can see that 14129 is pulling in not simply as uh, federal income taxes, but as other taxes, which is something that we don't normally see when we just have a W-2 situation that doesn't mean they're not paying the tax because remember, if you're in a W-2 situation, you are paying the tax, but you're usually only paying half of it because you're, you are the employee and not the employer portion. Here, you have to pay both and it's being calculated 
on the Form 1040 as opposed to as part of payroll taxes reported to you on the W-2 reported by the corporation on their payroll tax forms, the 941s. So then this is going to be uh, the, the, fe- the income tax, the federal tax, and then here's the other tax. Half of that tax is then ultimately going to the first page of the form 1040 that's 7065 which is coming from uh the schedule one page number two there's the 7065 which is coming from the schedule uh se so that's the that's the general outline all right let's go back to the schedule c now remember that this kind of leads us to think that a sole proprietor is just one person that doesn't have employees which isn't the case. You could still have employees. It's just that you as the sole proprietor, the owner of the business are not one of the employees. You don't give yourself wages typically because your payroll taxes will be calculated based on the net earnings of the business. If you need other people to come into the business, you could hire them possibly as contractors or as employees, just like any other business, based on the rules as to whether they qualify for a contractor or an employee, how much, uh, how much supervision do you have over them and their work and so on and so forth. If you have employees, then you've got to process payroll, which looks similar to, to, a, to a corporation, a C corporation. So comparing to a C corporation, again, if we hire employees in a C corporation, you have the executives that hire the staff right and and then and but on a c corporation both the executives and the staff are getting paid w-2 wages because the corporation is a separate legal entity here the books are separate separate in nature because we keep the books for the business separate from the personal but we ourselves are not employees of the business in that we're not issuing ourselves. We're like the executives and the owner of the Schedule C sole proprietor business. We don't issue ourselves a W-2 typically, but if we hire other people, we're going to be giving them the W-2 and having to follow the normal process for payroll, which is pretty much standardized from that point across different types of business entities. We got to do the withholdings and the whole payroll thing, which is a whole uh, thing in and of itself. Obviously for federal income taxes, we're going to summarize that data and that detail so that we can get the deduction for the wages and the relative payroll taxes for the employees that we have, not including ourselves. And then the net income that we get we'll have to pay self-employment tax, treating ourselves as both employee and employer, which will then pull over to the Schedule SE. So that's the basic idea. Now notice if if your income gets high uh, over this threshold, let's say your income goes up to uh, over 200,000, so like 220,000, and I go back on over. So, So now I have then 200,000 net income. If I go to my schedule SE, now it has to break out between the social security and the Medicare because there's going to be a cap on the social security calculation because we've gone over the cap. So we have that same kind of cap situation. Now, again, the general strategy, it seems to me, is for social security just like for federal income taxes when we're paying into it i'm going to pay as little as i'm legally required to pay even though i'm paying into a benefit program which could pay out in the future because i would rather save for my own retirement it's safer and the government's going bankrupt i wouldn't depend on it if i if i couldn't there are strategies however or sometimes when you might need to you might think about putting more money into the social security somehow. So again, if you had like a spouse that was was a, a homemaker and then the children left or something like that, and then there, that, now the two spouses are working in the business and so on, then you might say, hey, look, I don't wanna have all of my social security going to, going to one person's uh, social security number because that means that I'm only gonna get social security benefits going to one individual. You might wanna say, if married, I'm gonna split it out between 
the two individuals, which we talked about a little bit in a prior presentation, which could be complex in terms of how you're going to file the tax return. Do you need a do you need a, a partnership tax return? Do you need community property laws? We could split it evenly, or can you file two Schedule C's, uh, basically? But from a self-employment tax situation, because that's really the issue, is the self-employment. Uh, the question is, would I want to do that if I could? Like, would that even make sense? Well, if I'm making something over this threshold, 160,200, the answer might be no, because if I split it up, then then I have two people to hit that cap, meaning I'm going to still keep on paying into the system over and above the cap of 160,200, which I don't want to do. I don't want to pay any more into the system than I'm required to pay because I'd rather save for it myself instead of relying on the benefit program to pay out at retirement. However, if I'm under 160,200, then it shouldn't have an impact generally on my federal income taxes. And if I'm already maxed out, if one person, one spouse is already maxed out in their social security benefits calculations, it might be useful then to allocate some of the income if it's okay to do so given the circumstances of the business to, to a spouse if they're working in the business as well, because then you might not be paying any more taxes into the system, but having one person uh, having more qualifications to get possibly more benefits uh, at, at, at retirement. So those are just a couple things to think about. Also just realize you have complexities in the social security calculation if you also had uh, W-2 income. So let's, br let's bring this back to 100,000 and let's say that we had W-2 income as well of, of uh, let's say 100,000, right? So now I have a total of, of 200,000 on the income. Let's do W2. And then I'll put that over here. So, so now if I go into the form 1040, I have W2 income and I have the 100,000 that uh, is flowing in uh, as well. Actually, it went down, I brought it down to 80,000 here. So, so, so now the question is, well now, uh, hold on a sec. Let me make it, let me go up a little bit more. Let's go back. Let's say this was 100, 150,000. Okay. So then I'm going to say, okay, 150,000 W2 income, 80,000. So now we're at 230,000. Now the issue here is that this is all being applied to one social security number, which we saw should have a cap on it, but it's coming from two income sources and and note that one income source, the W-2 income, I would only be responsible for paying into Social Security half the employee portion as an employee, whereas this 80,000, I would have to pay twice as much the employee and employer portion. So, so in those situations, of course, tax software is quite helpful to help you to, to calculate and make sure that you're properly allocating the cap because if it wasn't for software to help you to do that, it's quite likely that you could end up paying more into Social Security than the cap is allowed, right? That kind of thing can happen if you have one person that has two W-2s that has a lot of income, because then again, the second W-2 doesn't know that the first one cleared the cap. So you're going to have too much that was paid into Social Security. Similar situation here, if you paid based on the cap of any one source, you would have too much paid into uh, the social security. So I won't go into the, we're going kind of long, so I won't go into the details of the calculation here, but just be, you know, just be aware of that situation as well. With the social security, it's not allocated, you know, per tax return, it's allocated per social security number. And if you have multiple sources of income subject to social security tax, and the combination of that income goes over the threshold of of the cap for social security then you're going to want to basically double check and make sure that you haven't overpaid into social security which again is something the software is usually helpful with